it gives me great pleasure to be here. As, and as you know, the president mentioned uh, the crowdsourcing that we undertook for AHPs into action in 2016, which developed the, the strategy we now have in England. And that was really the evidence base for me to inhabit the profession, both branches of the profession and sonography, and also paramedic practice since then. And I have to say, I always feel very at home at these events, and I, I know many of you. Uh, one of the things I was really intriguing, when I was actually very honoured to be asked by the Society and College to, to deliver this lecture, was thinking more about Stanley Melville, who was somebody I didn't know a great deal about. And one of the quotes that I found when I was doing the, the literature search was his untiring energy led him to do much for the welfare of the lay worker, radiographers, taking a prominent part in the foundation in the Society of, Society of Radiographers. And so my theme is, how can we be more Stanley Melville? and sort of leave that riff with me, if you will. Um, and it's really through leadership in radiography, our lived experiences. And it's what I want you to think about and take away at the end of the day, is how can we all, even for me as a non-radiographer, be slightly more Stanley Melville? And I'll come to what I mean by that in a second. The other thing I found was this obituary relating to Stanley Melville. And it said, if Melville had a hobby, it was helping other people. He spent his life assisting his fellow men, both individually and as members of a corporate body. And many of you who know me quite well in the audience know one of my favourite phrases is, how can I help you? And that is both in a sense from my role as chief in England, but also on an individual sense. And what is it that we can do to assist our fellow men, in a Melville-esque phrase, in a professional sense, to further our ability to serve our patients better. And that's what I'm really interested in by how can we be more Stanley Melville. And from my sense, my how can I help you is through policy. And I want to talk in part of my presentation about what we've been doing in England to really enable radiographers, both branches and sonographers, to, uh, to maximise your, your impact and practice but also about sharing lived experience, and I really want to, to think about that. And one of the things I've also used as a, a phrase elsewhere, and clearly this uh, convention is very much about research, evidence, best practice, and one of, but one of my phrases is always that there are no stories without data and no data without stories. And actually those stories and that qualitative narrative is really important and sometimes in terms of changing our practice and thinking. And later in my presentation, I'm going to come to a series of, of narrative experiences, which I think will be really helpful and insightful. So, just to re-rehearse, how as leaders at every stage in our career can we be more Stanley Melville? One of the things that we then moved to do in England was really think about how is it that I can develop a policy context? And when I came into post just over four years ago, there had never been a strategy for allied health in England. I'm very proud and privileged to represent both branches of the profession in sonography, but also 12 other professions. And actually, there are almost now in England 174,000 of us. In Scotland, it's some 11,200, and obviously smaller numbers in Wales and Northern Ireland. But from my point of view, how is it that I could create some sort of architecture for that number of us that didn't in any way reduce or diminish the work that society and college and the other professional bodies do that's unique to, to you, but actually gave us a bigger sense of community and a bigger impact? And it's one of those things on Twitter that we talk about that uh, hashtag of stronger together. And what we decided to do was really develop a, a framework, if you will, a strategy, which became AHPs into action. And part of that, we used crowdsourcing. And clearly, as you would imagine, in a qualitative piece of inquiry, we also undertook that engagement and involvement from politicians, senior thought leaders in the professions, and clearly looked at the international evidence and research as well. But that crowdsourcing piece, in terms of gaining the voice of each of the professions, was the first time in Western Europe that we believe that we actually that crowdsourcing methodology had been used to develop a national healthcare policy. And this is what it gave us. Uh, it was published back in 2017, and one of my voices today actually helped me launch that narrative at Westminster with politicians and Sir Bruce Keogh, who was at that point my line manager. And what I want to talk about today in, in really thinking about leadership and what we can do more in terms of supporting our fellow man is the priorities section. 
And the crowdsourcing after that thematic review of over 20,000 data points gave us these series of themes. So the priorities and commitments together, if those are added together, if we deliver those in our workplaces, then deliver these series of impacts at the top of the diagram, which actually chime with what was then the five-year forward view, and our overarching policy in England is now the long-term plan, and it still chimes and speaks to, to those commitments in that document. But I want to come into that priorities section, and there are two bits that I think are really pertinent to the lecture today. The first of which, and in all the priorities, many of my professional colleagues said, well, well are we not doing these things? And we're slightly offended by that. But what they are is saying that, yes, absolutely, we are doing them, but certainly we can do more. And actually, the first one of which is AHPs can lead change. Absolutely, we can. And I think it's that leadership that we can take at every level in our careers that's so important. And there's a, really, a real strong theme that comes through this about supporting our undergraduates and our preceptorship and new grads as they come into their professions, really to be leaders from the beginning of their careers. And I want to emphasize that as we go through. The second point is that our skills can be developed further. And I think for me, as Chief, many of you know, I've given an absolute commitment to advanced and consultant practice, and I will talk about that slightly more later. But at every level, it's, it's so important. And there's this little device which sits in AHPs into action, which is called a state of readiness tool. And it's, it could be seen perhaps as a little motherhood and apple pie. The top left is that unique point. What is your registrable background? What is unique to you? as a diagnostic or therapeutic radiographer. What is it only you must do? The bottom left is what can be delegated to assistant or associate uh, members of our teams or indeed other professionals. The top right is what can be taken on in advanced and consultant practice. And then the bottom right is that uh, sense of what other skills and competencies that are not uh, unique to us can we utilize to help our patients and their carers. And I think that's quite helpful in terms of thinking about where we've got scarce resources in multi-professional teams, how can we utilise this to really think about how we, we shape our, our teams and our roles? So in policy terms in England, there's been a real emphasis on thinking around clinical leadership for all of us, not just for radiography and sonography. And I think, for me, this is the document from NHS Improvement, Developing People, Improving Care, and the slides will be freely available, but the hyperlink is there at the bottom. This really sets out the link between leadership and improvement in patient care and therefore outcomes and forms the basis of the, the hooks, if you will, in England for us to, to develop that. What we did subsequently was then make a series of inquiry. Do come in. It's fine. Carry on. It's fine. Um, we, we then decided to look at what was the state of play of allied health leadership in England. And we asked a series of, uh, uh, Kingston St. George's University undertook this qualitative inquiry for us uh, in 2017. And the two questions on the left were what were asked of nurse executive directors in England who by and large have the leadership responsibility for us as, as, as professions. And the document you see on the right, and Joanne Fillingham, my colleague, who's my deputy in NHS Improvement, spoke about this in more depth on Monday, for those of you who were here. So I'm, I'm not going to re-rehearse what Joanne said. But nonetheless, we, we published this response document at my conference last year, and it, uh, it was sent to every chief executive and chair of an organisation in England, and basically asked them really to review their senior leadership. And what we are now seeing from that qualitative inquiry was the impact that having an 8D or band 9 director of allied health or chief AHP role made to uh, quantifiable things like the staff survey, like CQC findings, friends and family test, etc. And it really emphasised the need to strengthen our leadership, clearly, which radiographers can contribute to. The document that's come out subsequently to this is fairly recently from NHSI, is, is about the framework for action in terms of clinical leadership, really building on that first policy document of theirs. And there's a number of AHP case studies in that document which really emphasise, again, the contribution that we can make to multi-professional senior leadership, and I really want to emphasise the importance of that. Again, thinking about our careers, I was really delighted to see the College of Paramedics, who are very young compared to the uh, Society and College, which clearly has its 100th birthday coming very shortly. Uh, the College of Paramedics, very early in their thinking about what it means to be a profession and professional, and had done some thinking around the sort of infographic, if you will, that uh, 
uh, that could describe this, and they very kindly have shared this with a number of professional bodies to then build on. And I think for me that's that great thing about AHP into professional working, and delighted to see that this has also been utilised in a similar format for thinking in terms of the college around that career framework and infrastructure. And again, so important that we set out those expectations at the beginning of colleagues' careers as to what their career could look like. The other thing for me that's been really important is my emphasis on leadership at every level, and I absolutely believe that and really absolutely agree with it. And the Council of Deans of Health, which is the overarching body supporting the universities in the United Kingdom who provide nursing, midwifery and allied health undergraduate programmes, actually had some funding from the Burdett Trust for Nursing to recruit, very rigorously, 150 leaders from across the home countries in the UK, uh, and of the first cohort last year of the 150, 25 were AHPs, and a number of those were radiographers. I'm really delighted uh, that that was the case. And this was last June. I'm beginning to think about what will replace AHPs into action in England. And this group of, of early student leaders came together to help me with some of our thinking. And this is the, the group there, and a number of the radiographers were present. In terms of policy, the thing we were doing, and I will come to non-medical prescribing shortly, one of the things that we were asked when we were working with the Commission on Human Medicines, who in England worked with the MHRA on uh, safety around prescribing and, and really the regulatory issues, one of the things they asked me as chief was about advanced practice. Well, what is this advanced practice thing? They, they didn't put it quite like that, but, but across the professions in terms of nursing and across allied health professions, there were quite different approaches and structures around advanced practice. And so what we did, we worked with um, NH Health Education England, and on my behalf, Charlotte Beardmore from the Society and College very kindly undertook to chair with uh, Professor Mark Radford, who at that point was Chief Nurse at Coventry and Warwickshire Hospital, now uh, Deputy Chief Nursing Officer in NHS England, um, to uh, oversee this. And this document we published at the end of 2017 actually sets out in England the benchmark for advanced practice across the branches of nursing, midwifery, and allied health. And interestingly, for colleagues in the room who some, we sometimes struggle with this, and also ODPs do too, is that independent prescribing is not an adjunct to advanced practice. It's a competence that can be acquired in advanced practice, <clears throat> but for employers, I want to be absolutely clear, it is not included in this document as a requirement to be an ACP. So I think that's really important for us to, to note. The other thing that we've been doing around workforce policy is thinking about how do we bring colleagues into that leadership piece in the first place, and one of the issues is through uh, apprenticeships in terms of the apprenticeship standards that have been approved, and I think that, again, is a really important route. In terms of, I mentioned I'd touch on the prescribing and supply of administration of medicines. As you're aware, the Society and College worked with my team in NHS England very extensively, and we gained independent prescribing rights for therapeutic radiography, but regretfully not for uh, diagnostic at this stage. And we've also been doing additional work around the use of contrast media and using of PGDs. And we're currently also doing work with the Home Office around amending the current legislation around independent prescribing for therapeutic radiographers, because there's been a reclassification of some of the controlled drugs. So I think, again, that for me is uh, really important important work. And again, in leadership, it gives those additional tools in the practitioner's kit bag to serve our patients better. And that's what policy serves to do, is to really uh, enable our outcomes for patients to be more effective and their experience to be better. I touched on uh, the advanced practice. And again, in terms of consultant practice, we've made a real commitment to developing an infrastructure across the AHP professions for consultant practice. And as you see here, the ambition is that all consultants will be credentialed and actually there will be a series of recognised routes that will support that infrastructure, whatever the, the professional background. I'm conscious I'm galloping through this, but the slides will be available. I'm conscious there's rather a lot to, to get through in the time that we, we have. In terms of career planning, we've been doing quite a lot of work thinking about not just um, how do we gain our new workforce, but actually retaining the existing workforce and thinking about where is it that our careers go from here. And in Health Education England, our clinical fellow, Laura Roberts, has been doing some work around exactly that, thinking, is it, how is it that we can signpost to colleagues what their future potential could be? And this is actually a, a web page that exists on the Health Education England website, which is available to all of us at any stage of our career. And it really gives you a sense of thinking about what are the possibilities for your future career. And as you see, it includes uh, you know, management, education, fellowships, uh, public health, there's a whole range of things there. 
And of the case studies that are on the website, which are, are interactive, as you see here, there are four radiography colleagues who are actually included in, in that narrative, which is very important. And again, clearly there are other AHPs who are also featured in that, but it's worthwhile taking a look just to, to get a sense of what's available and to be able to signpost to other colleagues who might be interested in it. The other thing for me in terms of leadership, it's really important to have space to, to think about service development, service improvement, quality improvement, audit, and the like. And when I first came into PROS, there was also some work being done with nursing colleagues around safe and effective staffing. And the metric which was care hours per patient care day is clearly not appropriate for many allied health professionals, radiographers included. And what we've done since then is really work around what is it that we could do as an alternative. And clearly our medical colleagues, and many of you will work with both radiologists and oncologists who do have job plans, is that we looked at job planning and found for many AHPs it's very appropriate as a tool really to think about how is it that we use our time at any stage in our career from the time we qualify. And as you see now, we've been rolling this out uh, in 76 trusts to move forward with largely uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, dietetics and speech and language, but our next phase will be to roll out to both branches of the profession and sonography and indeed paramedics and other colleagues. So this guidance currently exists on NHS Improvement's website, but we will be shortly moving to, uh, to develop that uh, and refresh that guidance so it will be available. And I think it will be a really important and strong tool for the profession in terms of really evidencing that, that time that could be seen as non-direct patient clinical care, but still is inherently important in part of the work that we, we do. I also wanted to finally touch on the uh, final bit of policy area, which is around sonography. And for me, <clears throat> again, in our sonography capacity, not just in terms of obstetrics, but in general terms, has become quite limited. We are fishing from the pool predominantly of diagnostic radiography, but also physio and midwifery. And clearly, we are robbing Peter to pay Paul. And one of the things that we've been doing, again, working very closely with the society and college, is really thinking about the setting those pre-registration standards for direct entry to the profession. I've been working with the Department of Health and Social Care in Westminster on the regulation piece to bring that regulation, hopefully, to pass. And then really thinking about how we then would finesse that in terms of clinical placements. And from my point of view, again, I know there have been concerns about this. But I, as was said by the president, I've been a director of nursing, and when uh, I'm not a registered nurse, but when for nursing, uh, midwifery and health visiting became direct entry professions, you didn't have to be a general nurse before you went into those professions, everybody thought the sky would fall in. And clearly, that has not happened. So I think for, in terms of reassuring you, the, that has already happened to other professional groups where an entry to another registrable background happened first and has clearly been very successfully managed. And we're learning from that in relation to sonography, which is our next commitment. So in terms of my second phase, so that was the first bit I wanted to talk to you about, which I said was around policy. The second bit is really thinking about those lived experiences. And I wanted to thank Heidi Probst for this uh, really piece of work, which is Cousins and Posner's Five Behaviours of Effective Leaders. And I really like this particular narrative, and I've chosen eight voices of individuals I know across England who represent leadership at every level in radiography. And my current clinical fellow, Sarah Cooper, who is a physiotherapist, I asked her to interview those individuals without actually telling her why, other than that I wanted to include some of that narrative in my presentation. But it was really to give her, in her fellowship, in a leadership experience, a different lens on a profession that she probably thought she knew things about, but didn't know as much as she could. And I think it's really interesting, some of the reflections that she has given me back to. So what I've done in terms of the next part of the presentation is group the, the first three of those behaviours uh, together, and particularly around advanced and consultant practice and senior leadership. And the first four voices that you will hear from are really around uh, that aspect. And then the four, on the four remaining voices, I focused on the two behaviours, the enable others to act and encourage the heart, with particular focus on why we should be more Stanley Melville, to come back to my theme. For those at the beginning of their careers, as we know, we have particular issues with attrition from undergraduate programmes and also in the early years of practice. And for me, that's really important. So I wanted to kick off with Bev Snaith. And again, this is focusing around those first three, the model, the way, inspire and share a vision and really challenge. And as I mentioned, when we launched AHPs into action, our first ever strategy for allied health in England, um, we launched it in Westminster. Uh, we had a very good audience. 
And actually, there are a series of case studies in that document, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, which are across the allied health professions. And for me, again, as many of you will know, it's never about me, it's always about you. And actually, I did not open that with Sir Bruce Keogh and with our political colleagues. Bev opened it for me at Westminster and actually talked about her work and the case study that she was talking about in terms of advanced practice. And then we also were followed on by a paramedic and occupational therapist whose case study was also included. But I think it's really important for me in terms of the work that many of you do that I then enable that to have a bigger voice in different settings. And so what, this is a bit wordy, but again, the slides are available. What I wanted to pick up with here was the two uh, on the right of the narratives that, that Bev has offered to us. Clinical staff need to lead the development of evident, the evidence base. Research undertaken by clinicians is essential. We need to ensure research is completely embedded to change pathways. I've been a commissioner of services for two thirds of my career, and I had nine public health consultants uh, working for me when I was chief executive of the Primary Care Trust, who combed the evidence to really look at that population level availability of evidence as to whether we should commission new services or not. So for me, that's a really powerful statement in a, in a system sense. And then the, the bottom right, taking a step sideways from radiography to work on strategic NHS projects, gave me confidence in my leadership ability and provided skills such as project management that I could bring back to my clinical role. So from my point of view, never underestimate any opportunities that you are given to, to do things differently or to take an outside lens from radiography or sonography. It's so important. My next voice is my first ever Allied Health Professional of the Year, Dr. Nick Voznetsa. We instituted three years ago annual awards that uh, I have the privilege of, uh, that I have judging. And uh, of the first set of awards, we have a, a series of categories and those overall winners I then pick. And Nick's doctoral work in chest X-ray reporting, for me, the, um, the overall winner is somebody who's influenced both not just their profession, but actually the delivery of services across England. And actually, I think Nick was a very worthy winner in that sense, and I know he can't be with us today. But actually, in terms of the narrative that Nick offers, again, in those first three behaviours, the, the top right, seek out opportunities, so a similar theme coming on here for both, to really understand where, as a radiographer, you fit and can add value to the patient journey. <clears throat> It will help you understand how you can be of most benefit to patients and support colleagues to improve patient care and experience. And then bottom left, when you see us presenting, you see us as a polished article, you don't see the 35 drafts and months of practice talking through our slides. Don't let our months of work intimidate you. And I think that's, that's really a really true thing. It's about, about sharing and learning at whatever stage in our careers we are. And the next senior leadership voice was from Tracy, who's recently been appointed as Oncology Clinical Director at Lancashire Teaching Hospitals. And for me, again, a real example that actually, you know, I've been a nurse director and I'm not a registered nurse. There are many senior leadership posts that absolutely we can aspire to and that we can engage with. And I think that's, you know, a really important example. And in terms of Tracy's lived experience and voice, I want to bring you to the top left. Opportunities for consultant radiographer roles exist where there are the biggest gaps in the workforce. I have a fantastic opportunity from my colleagues following the appointment to the oncology clinical director role. AHPs are sometimes better placed for leadership roles. A few years ago where there had been an uproar, you don't need to be a medic to ensure delivery of quality service and effective care, and I absolutely endorse that. And then bottom right, as a consultant radiographer, you are often pioneering a way through. Where established mechanisms haven't been developed, such as consent, these require thought to ensure appropriate governance. Ongoing mentorship from medical colleagues is needed to ensure we achieve what is right for the patient. And clearly for me, in terms of advanced practice, it is not about taking our medical colleagues' jobs away, and it is not that we are cheap doctors. It is enabling doctors to deal with complexity that they need to deal with and enabling us to practice to the top of our licence, and I think that's so important. And my next voice in this section is Catherine Kirkpatrick, and I wanted to mention particularly around sonography because, for me, my commitment is to both branches of the profession and to sonography and the development of that as a standalone profession. And I met Catherine first when I went to Lincolnshire uh, probably 18 months ago now, and the interesting thing for me was a very senior radiologist when I was on a, a visit uh, in the Midlands actually described to me as radiographers as keeping the lights on in all specialties in Lincolnshire, and that's very powerful. And in terms of her leadership voice, I would bring you to the bottom left. Some of the skills you need to develop in, in, to advance practice cannot be taught. It is how you communicate with other professionals and, the, and in the MDTs to forge the relationships for these roles. 
Gaining clinical knowledge does help your confidence in these situations, but it's always about those relationships and the how can I help you stuff that I mentioned earlier. And then the bottom right, developing your skills and knowledge does not have to cost a lot, just your time. Shadow your senior colleagues, visit other departments, spend time with members of the MDT. Through this, you can see what changes you can make to improve the service for patients. And where I wanted to take us in the next part of the lecture is really thinking about through the eyes of our new grads and through students, because actually they offer us a different and hugely valuable lens, and we mustn't ignore it, and too often we do. And I think, for me, that's a really important thing. So I want to move into that next section now, if I may, with Penny Owens, who I was really delighted was appointed as the Director of Allied Health Professionals for the new Combined Trust at the University Hospitals of Derby and Burton. And indeed, I was equally delighted that she has been appointed as one of the Allied Health Professional Representatives on the new National NHS Assembly, which is, is chaired uh, independently, but basically holds the NHS to account on its delivery of the, the overall policy, the long-term plan. And I want to move now into that, those last two behaviours, the enable others to act and encourage the heart. And with Penny's voice, I really wanted to uh, really pick up the top left. The success of our professions is dependent upon <clears throat> attracting and supporting students, apprentices and newly qualified clinicians. These are our future. We need to look at new and innovative ways of supporting them in their training. And then secondly, the top right, Students and new grads are entering the workplace with training in leadership. This is at the current time that doesn't continue when they come into the workforce and the workplace. We need a cohesive vision of what leadership should look like in our professions and within the NHS, and really, I think, that trajectory from, from student and preceptorship onwards. And then I wanted to pick up with Tom, who's, this is uh, uh, this time, well, it's actually at UKRC, Tom, isn't it, last July, um, <clears throat> with his AHP badge, I'm, I'm delighted to say. Um, and actually, Tom and I first met via Twitter, which I, I have to say, I, I undertake a lot of my business with Twitter. When uh, I was a chief exec, people used to put their head around the door and tell me stuff, and now people direct message me on Twitter and tell me stuff, and it's, it works, you know, for me in a similar sort of narrative. And actually, I think Tom has offered me a really helpful voice through his narration on Twitter of a number of conferences, and actually at my own that he came to for the first time last summer. And actually, I'm opening the Royal College of Occupational Therapy Congress on Monday next week, and Tom is offering his voice to occupational therapists in my closing statement uh, to that Congress. But his voice to you here is around providing the top left a rounded education to students as an investment in the future teaching them how to take an x-ray is easy, the development of a rounded professional with appropriate communication skills who understands patient-centred care, that is essential but takes time. And then his other thought that I've really picked up on is having a role model who is a visible and credible leader who identified my strengths and supported me. I now try and pass on all I have learned from him to the students that I have worked with. And in this section next, <clears throat> again, I wanted to, and I've thanked Heidi earlier for bringing me in the direction of these five leadership behaviours. Her work, at <clears throat> again, I found particularly inspiring. And the, the voices that she offers to us, again, top left. From an early point, I was inspired by people who knew what they were doing and were driven to improve patient care. Not always people in senior management roles, some were band sixers and in team leader roles who made a difference to patients in many different ways. People who managed to make changes against the odds and through thinking outside the box to improve patient care. And for me, that's what we must always do. And then the second point I wanted to pick up on is the top right. You can support changes to patient care from an early point in your career. Seek out the people that make a difference and make things happen not just people within your department, speak to innovation leads or those involved in research. And I think for me, again, the second part of my, my speech is really around that emphasis on leadership at every level and that we all absolutely make a difference in contribution to patient care and that must be respected and supported. And then finally, I wanted to come to Sarah Brado, who I again first met through the student leadership program that I mentioned, the hashtag 150 leaders, who is now just qualified as a therapeutic radiographer and, in fact, is starting work this week in her first job in Birmingham, which is, is great. But Sarah's been a really keen supporter of working with, not just with her, her fellow students in, in the profession, but also with other allied health professional students and actually getting a sense of what is possible at the beginning of your career in terms of thinking more widely and working with other uh, professions to actually gain a better understanding of what the patient pathway of care could look like. 
And in her voice, I wanted to pick up the two bottom uh, points. The for bottom left, leadership is not management. It is about being a role model. It's not always easy to see those qualities in yourself. Sometimes you need a nudge or a push. And then the bottom right, don't ever think that you can't do something just because you're just a student or a newly qualified radiographer. And absolutely, I would support that. So I think, in summary, what I wanted to come to was really where we find ourselves now in policy terms in England. I mentioned the long-term plan, and the workforce was mentioned in it, but it wasn't actually the, the centre of the document. And what we've just published in the last couple of weeks is this interim people plan for 2019-20. Uh, and in it is this whole section on leadership, which I think, given the nature of the uh, lecture, I think, is really important. And it sets out a series of aims in the, the, the document for this current financial year about what is it that we want to try and do in England for all of us, not just for, uh, for radiographers, but AHPs and, and wider, in terms of, of leadership culture. So this clearly thinks about boards and organisations, senior leadership, our support staff, you know, the whole, whole team. And then there's a series of how that will actually be uh, enabled and, and brought about. So I guess where I wanted to, to leave us is the AHP part of the, the document in terms of the people plan. These are the things that we are seeking to do uh, by 2024. So focusing on future supply, which clearly for therapeutic radiography is looking very difficult at the moment, but we really, really must focus on that and also the other branches of the profession. Bridging the gap between education and employment, which again is, is so important. But then the final one for me, which is really enabling the workforce to deliver and grow. So for those of us who are already registrants, it's about how is it that we can actually enable us, given the, the pressures of workload that we have, to be supported in our careers and actually retained in roles. It may not necessarily be a clinical facing role, but retained in the service in some way in terms of those years of experience. So for those of you who were here last night, I will uh, really offer you this, it's not going to work. Um, how can we be more Stanley Melville? Thank you.